Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2016. This is the week in charts. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. And why stop at 11? I did an article a while back, 11 fatal trading mistakes that traders can't help but make and what you can do about it. And recently I was approached by someone looking for content and they said, uh, look, every now and then we put out an ebook or whatever, a special report, et cetera. And you've got tons of content. We'll just grab some of your content off your website. So I didn't even know they were going to grab this article. And I decided to freshen it up a little bit. And I thought that'd be like a, I don't know, 20 minute job. But here I'm about a week into it. But so I'm still working on it. But I got to thinking, why just stop at 11 when I started thinking about some other things that need to be added to the article. Anyway, as is playing the screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole it from Greg Morris. So let me show you the, the article on my website. Now it's a work in progress. So if you go to the link, which I don't actually have published yet, but you could dig around my website and find it, um, you'll see that as a draft. But this was the article I wrote about a while back. And then what was happening was I was doing my accounting, or actually my wife was forcing me to do some accounting, which I hate to do, a couple of months into the new year of 2016. And when I emailed people and said, hey, uh, you want to renew, a lot of what I received were confessions. And I held on to longs too long, over leverage, over traded. I sought action over opportunity. I confused the need to be right when making money. I day traded when I should have just stuck to position trading. So that got me to thinking about some of the mistakes that are being made. And, and I'm not going to go through these because I've written about them in detail. But I just want to kind of skim over them before we get into the today's presentation. Now, letting the big brain control the little brain, that's not nasty like you would think I'm implying here. All I'm saying is letting the amygdala, which is a little part of your brain, that makes snap decisions control the big part of your brain. Now, all trades have emotions attached. All decisions have emotions attached. But you have to be really careful not to make emotionally charged trades. You have to embrace your emotions, knowing that there's going to be emotions involved in any decision, and you have to accept them. But the amygdala tends to, uh, or it's the emotional part of our brain that we, we tend to make snap decisions because of. And if you ever snapped at your spouse, you'll know that you say things and you can see those words coming out of your mouth, almost literally going towards them. And then you're kind of thinking like, no. <laughs> so you only need a few seconds. So solving that problem of making the emotionally charged trades when you're not supposed to, the solution to that is simple. Just maybe count to three before you make a trade or give yourself a few seconds to think about what you're doing. And, and if you want to practice this in real life, the next time you get angry with your spouse and you, you that initial reaction just comes flying up into your head, just sit on that for a few seconds. It only takes a few seconds. And in one of these behavioral finance books that I read last year, um, I don't know if it was Montier or another one, but it's, it's one of those. And anyway, are thinking fast and slow. They were talking about how Google tried a feature where you could call back an email after you hit send. And to their surprise, uh, like 75% or even more emails would call back. It was so successful, I think they actually had to delete the feature. Because if you give yourself just a little bit of time to think, you, you, you pull back on that. Uh, you start feeling that regret. You start thinking less emotionally charged and I keep saying emotionally charged because everything has emotions attached and I don't want to get into that but that's if you read the article you can get into that uh, confusing the issue with facts that's just like uh, letting news events uh, work their way into your trading or fundamentals or whatever the reason as opposed to the facts whether uh, I'm sorry as opposed to what's actually happened is the stock going up is it going down where you stopped out etc I'm going to get into a few of those in just one second. Trying to control the situation in life, you your success is from controlling the situation for the most part. You control things to the extent that you can, and, and that's exactly what makes you successful. Unfortunately, in trading, trying to control the unknowns. You can't control other people, and as I wrote in here, like Mark, a famous uh, uh, 
favorite quote from Mark Douglas is that all it takes is one A hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. Uh, being undercapitalized, that's a big problem that I see quite often. And if you go in and watch this uh, video that I have here, I talk about a case where it, it, it actually ended uh, badly by being undercapitalized. So and I'm going to come back to this in just a few minutes, but just recognize that maybe you might be undercapitalized. It's a lot easier to trade if you've got a million dollar trading account and you're risking, let's say, 1% or 2% of it. So a $10,000 loss, $20,000 loss, no big whoop. Uh, your next big gain might be uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000, whatever. So that's going to get buried really quick. But if you're trading a small account and you get whacked a little bit, and because of slippage, commissions, and everything else, and all the other problems associated with smaller account, then you're going to feel like a bit of a loser. I, I know some very wealthy people who keep funding a small trading account, and they, they put like 20K in, they blow it up. They put like 20K in, they blow it up. They do that over and over and over again, and they always feel like such a loser at doing that. But the reality is if they just would fund it properly and trade properly, then they would have been a successful trader many years ago instead of just constantly blowing up small accounts. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you're broke uh, if you're undercapitalized. Maybe you're not funding your account properly. Holy grail hunting, I see it all the time. Uh, that's I think here's the deal. I preach against holy grail hunting, but if I wouldn't have gone on that big holy grail hunt, I wouldn't have had all these epiphanies and I wouldn't have come back to the simplified trading approach that I believe in strongly. So I, I encourage you not to go on the Holy Grail hunt, but until you actually go on the hunt, you'll realize that it's, it's not that complicated. It's not easy, but it's not nearly as complicated as many people try to make it. And there is no Holy Grail, and we're all playing on a level playing field, okay? Provided you're not doing anything illegally, okay? then we're all on a level playing field. And in some cases, the small private trader actually has some advantages. And as I often say, sometimes I'll mention an IPO in my core trading service, or lately that's been fairly often because we've had this IPO bull market past several years. And my RIA clients will give me a high five, but they'll say, I can't, I can't put my clients into that. I can't get size off in that, but the, the smaller clients give me a high five and then they actually take the trade because they could actually, they're actually nimble enough to go in and get it. So in some cases, you actually do have an advantage. And that's one thing that I've seen throughout the years, people who are very successful with the methodology on a personal level, it's just not, it's a lot of times it's just not scalable, okay? So you can't go in and trade uh, micro cap stocks and then be incredibly successful and think, well, I'm just going to scale this on up. And many people have tried to do that over the years. And I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus because uh, it, it's not their problem. It's just, it's just a fact that sometimes you can't scale things like that. Uh, confusing yourself with what you see is all there is uh, in a, in choppy markets, people think, well, I'm just going to sell spreads, and that'll work until they don't, which we're going to get into in just one second. But a lot of people don't realize that a market, sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down, and sometimes they go sideways. You're probably thinking, duh. But you'd be surprised a new crop comes along every few years when the market just chops sideways for a long time. They begin getting sucked into these reversion to the mean type of systems and start trading those. So there's a lot more to it than what you might be observing at the time. And in Thinking Fast and Slow, the authors talked a lot about W-I-S-I-A-T-I, which you see is all there is. And that's just a, a human trait and a problem that we have. Uh, winging it, lack of planning, and that's something we're going to expand upon a little bit today. But there's a lot of uh, winging it that happens that we're – in the heat of battle, we don't have a plan, or if we do have a plan, we don't follow that plan. And then number 11 is you do it anyway, and this is something that I preach about quite often. People know what they're doing wrong, but they do it anyway. In fact, I actually wrote a special report just on that. So kind of along the lines of winging it, 
the lack of planning or build as you go is something that I see quite often. You wouldn't go in and try to build a house without some sort of serious plan and just say, oh, well, uh, let's just add a bedroom here and let's add a bedroom there. And, and I've seen these kind of houses that people actually have done this before. I guess people just with the, with not a whole lot of money or for whatever reasons that you end up with this horrible looking house with all these little rooms and it makes, there's zero flow and it makes absolutely no sense. There is a science behind uh, building a home. We've never built one, but I know at least any house that I've ever seen built, there's been a plan to do things. So you can't make it up as you go. And I guess that's not really a new problem. That kind of, that kind of goes along with winging it. But what I'm referring to is a recent email that I received it's kind of inspired this. It says, by the way, CNX bow tie down on Friday's close. Why don't exit if it triggers a bow tie short? Well, the short answer to that is that because it's it's not following the plan. That's not following the plan. The plan was to exit on a stop. It's not a rules-based methodology. Now, there's nothing wrong with a rules-based methodology for exits. If you have some sort of signal you're going to exit on, that's fine. I've learned over the years, it's just a lot easier to just exit on a stop. And I actually uh, elaborated much more on this. It's like, it's one of those things where this was my quick answer that I gave this gentleman <laughs> when I got uh, into my service page where I, I put the answers, I published the answers there so all the clients can see the answers and it's going to become a frequently asked question, the so-called fact page. So I don't have to answer a lot of the same questions over and over again. And so other people can benefit. So I'm not just giving the one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching anyway. So I ended up writing about three pages and he's like, Holy moly. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, I just, I couldn't stop myself. And that's kind of why I'm talking about a lot of these things today. So let's take a look at that real quick. So you can see what I'm talking about. And this is the uh, this is the CNX trade here. And going back to where we got in, we got in uh, way back in February, and the trade was a bow tie way back then. And then uh, it triggered entry, and we took partial profits at this level here. Now, keep in mind, and this is something that I wrote about extensively on the service page, but our goal, obviously, is to take a short-term profit profit on a trade, get that swing trade profit out. And then hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, but that's the ultimate goal. So you have to have, you have to be somewhat positive about things and, and have some kind of goal in mind. But the ultimate goal would be to have the position turn into a longer term trend following type of position. And so far, so good, knock on wood. Now, once you're in longer term trend following mode, you have to remember that you have shifted gears you're no longer in that swing trade mode. Your stops get a little wider, and often there's nothing to do. Now you might feel uh, in, you might feel pressure to do something, which we'll talk about in a few minutes when we get to some more of the psychology here. But a lot of times, the best thing to do is absolutely nothing. So again, we use a stop in here, and that's where the stop is or was, and then. You can see that we did, he was correct, we did have a bow tie sell signal. Now again, if that's your methodology to sell when you have a bow tie sell signal, then you have to consistently follow that methodology. And one thing I was thinking about over the last few days is, no matter what your methodology is, and I often preach, it's not my way or the highway, and I am a little passionate about a few things, which you'll probably see uh, come out in a few minutes. But if you're doing something and you're doing something well and you're following it, then then do that, okay? Be good at doing that. And no matter what you're doing, there's going to be good and it's going to be bad. So if you have an exit-based system and you exit when you have a bow tie, that's going to take you out of a lot of bad trades. That's going to take you out of a lot of bad trades that turn into much worse trades, okay? But it's also going to keep you out of a lot of winning trades. So there's going to be good and bad in doing that. But the point is, if that's part of your rules, 
then that needs to be part of your rules, and that's what you need to always do. You can't just decide today, instead of honoring the stop, you're going to follow this exit base rule. Now, I, I did meet someone once at Hired Traders, and he was telling me that uh, they were using some sort of, um, I don't know if it was artificial intelligence or whatever, to, to do certain things. But they had a system where they had things quantified, and whenever someone broke the rules, they talked to them about it, whether it did good or bad. And they had to make a decision on whether or not they were going to incorporate a new rule or not. If they kept breaking the rules and they decided not to incorporate it, then they're just a rule breaker and they're winging it. But if they decided that, th that this was worthy of a new rule, then that's fine. My only caution is you've got to be really careful if you want to get in, if you get into that type of, of business, because I think that eventually you could keep adding more and more rules and you could end up with an analysis paralysis. And I, I keep jumping ahead, but as I'm going to say in a few minutes, there's always a reason to exit or nearly always a reason to exit a position and rarely a reason to stay. So we did have this bow tie sell signal that happened. And then knock on wood, so far the stock has worked its way higher in here. So we had to sell and then so far it's headed higher. Now they won't always come back. That's one thing I can guarantee. But, yeah, did you say hope? There's no hope in trading. Yeah, I, I know. And usually every time I say hope, hopefully, that I say, uh, hey, did I just say hope? And then as somebody poured out a few weeks ago, you don't have to keep saying that. We know you're not living in, uh, you're not smoking the hopium. But, yeah, I hear you. So, so far, so good. And, and hopefully <laughs> this will turn into a situation where this stock goes on to make new highs and it becomes a great lesson in not creating a rule. In other words, micromanaging yourself out of a position. Now, as I've said before, I've asked my wife, Marcy, hey, what do you think about my column? And I don't ask her anymore because she's, she's going to give me the same answer. But she says, you say a lot of the same shit over and over. It's like, well, I'm going to keep saying the same stuff over and over until you people get it. So I'll write extensively about micromanagement and say, well, I've, I've got that covered. I'll need to find something else to talk about. And then the next week, somebody will email me on micromanaging himself out of a trade. Now, what's interesting is at first glance, I thought that was a bow tie down there. And again, as I said a second ago, there's usually always a reason to exit a trade. But upon further analysis, there was not an actual bow tie on that particular day. Uh, but I've seen it happen quite often where a stock will bow tie down and then go on to make new highs that were long or do something else. But you could also argue, well, maybe uh, this stock was dead money here. Look, it went, it went, oh, how long was that? A couple of months? On at least on a net net basis, without any forward progress, should you exit the trade? No, follow the plan. Okay, it nearly bow tied here. Should you exit the trade? No, follow the plan. Notice it went on to make new highs. Okay, so again, there's nearly always a reason to exit, and rarely a reason to stay. And I'm going to bring that up in just one second. So again, there's nothing wrong with a rules-based exit, but you can't add them on the fly. So as I've kind of alluded to a minute ago, if this person I was talking about who had traders, if they kept breaking the rule, then they either were going to get fired or they had to justify and evaluate that rule they kept breaking as going to be the new rule, okay? Uh, in other words, breaking the rule by adding a new rule, okay? So... Is there a reason why they're doing what they're doing? If so, then by all means, add it in. I've reached a point now where it's kind of like I went through that trader's journey I often talk about, where you start off here with a blank chart, and then you go through all this complexity, and it gets more and more complex, and then all of a sudden you start peeling the indicators back, add it back to where you started. And that's kind of where I am now. And I'm resisting the urge to go back through another cycle here because I found something that works. It's not perfect. It's something that I'm embracing is not perfect. And that's one of the secrets to trading is 
find something that works, but embrace the fact that it won't be perfect because nothing is. If I had a perfect system, you'd never see my fat ass again, as I often say, as I often joke, right? But I've reached the point where, you know what, I'm just going to use a stop and I'm going to let that stop widen out with time to make that transition from shorter term trader, shorter term swing trader to longer term trader. And that's going to allow me to ride out some corrections. And yes, I realize there might be some sort of sell signals along the way, but I'm just going to ignore them. Yeah, I might grimace a little bit and go, oh, geez, it's bow tied down, not looking so good. But you know what? Let's just honor that stop and let the chips fall where they may. And once again, there's always a reason, nearly always a reason to exit and rarely a reason to stay. Now, I often say that, and I didn't realize that someone much smarter than me had actually already quantified that. And I wrote about, if you look at my homepage, it's there now. It might get bumped off with today's weekend charts, but it, it's going to be in recent commentaries. Uh, and you can go back and watch the weekend charts from, I think, three weeks ago or two weeks ago, where I talked about what Robert Frey said. And Robert Frey says that 75% of the time, you're in a state of regret. In other words, drawdown. And if you think about that, that's very true. It seems like you're always observing or nearly always when you're observing your stocks or whatever market you may be trading Forex, for instance, uh, case in point, I was up uh, on a position earlier today quite nicely. I'm still up nicely, but I've already given up some of that profit since this webinar started. So I'm looking over at my screen here thinking that, oh man, I'm losing money. But in reality, it's a positive observation if you think about it because net net I'm up more today than I was yesterday but what am I feeling I'm feeling like I'm a loser or I'm losing because I observed it before this presentation started and it was higher than it is now so the more observations you make as I often say the more inclined you're going to be to micromanage and not follow your plan and as Mr. Frey pointed out, 75% of the time, you're going to be in that state of regret. And again, I keep, I don't know why I'm jumping ahead so much today, but as I'm going to point out in a minute, the fear, or fear I should say, is a much stronger emotion than reward is. So let's, like getting back like to my trading service, Let's say in the hypothetical portfolio, we're up 1% overall on, on a day. So based on, let's say, 100K, that's that's $1,000. And uh, in every day, I start off by saying, hey, it went up a little bit today. Let's not focus on the day to day. But I know everybody's watching the numbers, so I have to talk about what happened. And I was like, hey, we had a good day. You know, we're up about 1%. That's 1000 bucks. Well, the next day, we might give up. Let's say we give up half of that. Okay, we're down a half a percent. Well, that that we're still up about a half a percent over the last couple of days, and that's a pretty good thing. That's a positive, right? But no, everyone sees the negative, and guess what? That negative completely erases the positive. Okay, let's say it gets no worse than down five five hundred. So net net, you're still up five hundred, but you don't feel like you're up five hundred. You feel like you lost. 500. Does that make sense? It's like you, the fear is a much stronger motivated. So you're always going to feel like there's a reason to exit. You're always or nearly always going to feel like you're losing even when you're winning. And I just thought that was such a beautiful thing that he had actually pointed out is, is an actual thing. Oh, there it is. Fear is a bigger motivator than reward. That's a problem with putting a animations in the slide. I don't know where I'm going. But yeah, again, fear is a much bigger motivator than reward. And that's the that's one reason I think that we're always are quite often never happy for long in this business. Because as again, beating a dead horse about Mr. Frey, 75% of the time you're gonna have that negative observation, it seems like. And Making money makes you feel good, but losing money makes you feel really bad. And it erases all of that good and then some. So that's something it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. 
but you have to reach a point where you're almost in, in the, I think the perfect word here is, is flip it to where you just don't care. And if uh, you, if you've read the, the way of the turtle by Curtis faith and then followed up with like some of his interviews on that. And he was criticized because I think he had a, a pretty substantial drawdown afterwards after the, the book had came out, come out. But he said, well, what you didn't realize is had I not been had the attitude going in, I would never made the money in the first place. So he was a little flippant with the money. Now, you definitely want to have some sort of serious money management control in place. And you want to do all the things that are preached. Like you only want to pick the best stocks. You don't want to trade when there's nothing to do and seek action. You want to do all these things. But in following the plan, you almost have to be a little flippant and and not get so attached to the fact that it's going against you or you're going in through the little drawdown of the position you put on yesterday is immediately at a loss and so on and so forth and just follow through what you're doing. So fear, again, not to beat the dead horse on that, is a much bigger motivator than reward is. So we do have this, this innate urge to stop the pain, to do something, and as I wrote in that aforementioned article, we're just not made to trade. And your biggest your biggest step towards becoming successful or staying successful is embracing the fact that we're not made to trade and recognizing when those things are beginning to take hold, recognizing when that fear is becoming a greater motivator than the reward recognizing that sometimes there's nothing to do, recognizing that you don't want to add a new rule to your system because you're going to end up at some point with analysis paralysis. You're going to realize that there's always a reason to exit and never to stay. And if you don't stay, you're never going to get the big winners. So there's going to be this incredible urge to micromanage. You do not, it, it, I'm always talking about how successful you are, and you're thinking, how do I know you're successful? Well, because you wouldn't be spending so much time studying the markets, and you wouldn't be attending a webinar it, right now. Most people don't have that, that uh, attention span or aren't that motivated, but the people that become traders are. And, and they're, they're smart people, and that's often a hindrance, as I often talk about. But they are motivated people. They become successful in prior or current careers, and then – they approach trading. That's usually the way it, it works. So your success in life does not necessarily translate to success in the markets because the markets are, they're kind of perverse in the way it all works. But you're going to have this incredible urge to micromanage. And my first micromanagement story was many, many years ago. And I, I didn't realize that, that it no longer trades until recently. I was looking it up, trying to find a, a chart for this show. In fact, uh, but I remember once I once shorted Dell computer, and I forget what signal I had or whatever. But for some reason, I had to stop at 55. And I remember back then, I had a a day job, and so my trades were done by by phone. There was an automated uh, punch in system, and when no one was around, I would I would I would log in and uh, to the automated system on the phone and get quotes and I got a price quote on Dell and it was 54 and seven eighths. And I decided, you know what? That's close enough to 55. So I exited the trade at the market and I think I've got 54 and seven eighths was the price. And I felt pretty good for a moment because I saved an eighth, that whole eighth on the, on the stock. That's back when stocks traded at eights. And I immediately called my dad, who I got into the trade also. He used to trade with me way back in the day. And I told him to exit, so he exited. And then Dell went down to the single digits over the next several months. And they were, uh, it was found out that they were cooking the books. Okay. And sometimes you get a signal first and then the, the news later surfaces, and that's kind of the beauty of technical analysis. And he hasn't done it recently, but many of uh, family gatherings, he, he, he'd point out, remember that Dell trade? 
And that's probably why we don't trade anymore because uh, together, because I become responsible for him too. So uh, do be careful if you're going to be responsible for someone other than just yourself, by the way. Anyway, so that's my little first story and my first little foray into micromanagement versus following the plan. Another problem that I see is lack of consistency. Are you a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker? You can't be a breakout trader on Monday, a reversion to the mean trader on Tuesday, a trend follower on Wednesday, and some sort of hybrid of a trend follower and a swing trader on whatever day that is, <laughs> whatever today is, okay? So you have to be really careful in that. And do what you do, but do just that. So again, it's not my way or highway, but if you're trading a methodology and you fully understand the methodology and you've done your homework and you put in your reps, so to speak, then do that and do it well. Just be really careful not to get sucked into the siren call of the church of what's happening now. Because you you will be tempted when markets are choppy, you're going to be tempted to give up trend trading and maybe implement some sort of choppy market system, i.e. reversion to the mean trading. Now, not knowing your system is a very dangerous thing. So, it, and I'm going to rehash some of the nuances of my stuff in just a minute. Because I don't want to speak too much for other people's systems. But I do tend to pick on the reversion to the mean people a little bit. Because I've been there. I've done that. I got the t-shirt. And there's a lot of things. And, and some of you privately have been talking with me on it. But uh, it ends badly. And my situation ended very badly. Okay. And there's a, as I often say, there's two drink minimums on stories there. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about uh, these things that unfolded. But reversion to the mean trading, it's easy to kind of explain reversion to the mean trading. All you do, if a market goes up a lot, just sell it, okay? Or if a market goes down a lot, just buy it, okay? And that's all you have to do. Well, a lot of times it'll just reverse from that overbought or reverse from an oversold level. And it's a great way to have a very brief but brilliant career. But unfortunately, as I preach, that'll work until it don't. And if you don't know what could happen, you can end up in a whole lot of trouble. And because last week I said, uh, is it an ironic, don't you think? I, I thought it was kind of interesting that one of the biggest advocates for reversion to the mean trading now appears to be a trend follower. Okay, welcome to the club. Glad to have you. And I would never throw anyone under the bus or judge anyone because we all, the market judges us daily and the market humbles you daily and the market hands you your buttocks more often than you really care for it to, right? But you have to know your system and you have to know what can happen badly. And, and so somebody emailed me and said, hey, is it this person? And I'm like, look, I'm not going to answer that. But I knew who they were talking about, and I did a little Googling on them, and it looks like the chickens have kind of finally come home to roost there, too, because they were selling options, and they just got busted because they tried to hide. Now, this is someone who started with a little bitty account, or a small account, I should say, and then became a money manager and was trading hundreds of millions of dollars worth of options. And then you could do some Googling on it, and you could figure out who I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that they obviously didn't fully understand their risk, and they just got busted for trying to hide, I think it was $50 million worth of losses. Well, that's illegal activity, so that's wrong. But obviously, they didn't realize that something bad could happen, and it's kind of interesting. Now, maybe it's in hindsight, but if you do some Internet searches on this situation, you'll see that there were some people – that were commenting on it that said ahead of time, like, what is the risk control here? They don't seem to be wrapping their head around the risk control. So you have to wrap your head around the risk control and know what could go wrong. Now, I left this in from last week, and then I threw my little uh, slide in there, too. 
A wise king knows what he knows and what he doesn't. That's Lord Lannister from the HBO series King of Thrones. And I'm just uh, finally got talked into watching that. And I've been kind of binge watching it, admittedly, but it's been kind of cool. A lot of uh, a lot of interesting logic that that applies to trading. Everything applies to trading with me, you know. No matter what happens, it's kind of like, oh, uh, that makes it a good trading lesson, you know. But I think if you take the word trader out, I'm sorry, king out, and put the word trader, then that's what a wise trader knows. Now I'm not going to get into a wise trader knows what he knows and knows what he doesn't. I'm not going to get into the details of this because we covered it last week. But the bottom line is the wise trader knows that something really bad can happen. And then you have to know how you're going to deal with that if you're trading some sort of reversion to the mean type of system, like we just talked about, selling options, for instance. And then you have to know what you don't know, okay? That's kind of like a Socrates quote, right? Socrates, uh, you know what you don't know. And that is you don't know what the market's going to do, but you have a plan. And as a trend follower, and I know I'm getting ready to say, ha ha, easier said than done, right? All you have to do is just follow along and know that you don't know what's going to happen and let it unfold. Now, it's one thing to know, but it's another thing to know and embrace. And that's a big problem that I see quite often is that people know, but they fail to embrace. And maybe the problem is the map is not the territory. It's very easy to understand these nuances, but very hard to live with them. So under the knowing column, there will be extended flat times, and I'm going to get to the Gelber quote in just one second, which sort of uh, is a very eloquent way of putting that. But there will be times when you will go into a drawdown. That drawdown might last for a while. The good news is if you do go into a drawdown with a trend-following system, chances are something has changed. The trending market has become choppy. So the beauty is you will eventually get stopped out of all your positions. And that, that drawdown just goes into a flat time, meaning that you start losing on positions, you get stopped out, there's nothing new to do, so you're in a flat time. So the flat time, again, could be either a drawdown or a period of when there's nothing to do. Now, the actual embracing of it, knowing there's to be flat times is one thing, actually embracing it is another. So, and that's one thing that I often talk about is I see this problem over and over and over. The market starts to flatten out a little bit, starts doing this for a while. Most people quit a trend-following methodology. Usually they quit right about here. That what happens, the market takes off again. And if you study technical analysis, really study technical analysis, you'll know that sometimes this base is actually – a good thing it gives the time the market it gives the market time he tried to say to digest his gains and often you'll get a big trend shortly thereafter the problem is when you're this far into the base you don't know how much further it's going to go so once again it comes back to that a wise trader knows what he knows and knows what he doesn't and yes i'm going to probably beat the dead horse in that quote quite a bit uh, if you're tr trading my style, we're we're not swinging for the fence on every trade. We're trying to get a swing trade out, and we're hoping that it will turn into a longer-term trade. But we are playing for the outlier. We're not swinging for the fence. In other words, we put a trade on. We hope it will become an outlier, but we take appropriate action just in case it doesn't. We take a partial profit, half, at a swing trade profit, meaning that – Based on our risk, if we're risking five points, we'll take five points off. When we're up five points, I'm sorry, we'll take half off when we're up five points. And then we're going to trail a stop, and we're going to let that stop loosen up just in case it turns into a longer-term trend. And that's what the money is. A few big winners can make you a year. Now, but what people do by not embracing that and not wrapping their head around that, what they do is they sharpshoot the signals. Okay, I borrowed that term from Greg Morris. 
and he might have been talking about like a signal that you follow, like an overall market timing signal. It's probably what he's talking about. And let's say you got a major sell signal in the indices. Well, by you can say, well, I'm going to ignore it this time, and here's why. Okay. In my case, it's kind of like, well, here or here are three stocks that I like. I like all three, and I recommended them, let's say, over a period of a week or two or whatever. And you're like, hmm, well, I like this one. But I'm not going to take these other two. Well, chances are, as Murphy would have it, you're going to end up with a losing trade and miss the two winners. And as I say quite often, it happens so many times. This is why I beat the dead horse on it. Even recently, it's like I'll say, hey, um, how's it going? Uh, you know, I, I noticed your subscription has expired. Would you like to renew? No, I'm going to pass. It's like, okay, well, you know, I like to be better at what I do and, and, and serve the customer better. Could, is there anything I'd have done better? It's like, well, I didn't make any money. That's for starters. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Well, how did you not make money? We had a pretty good period of time. Did you did you get this little IPO that we're up 50% in? No, I didn't get that one. And it's like, okay, did you get this other one we're up 50% in or 60%, whatever? No, I didn't get that one, but I took all those sneakers you recommended. So like I said last week, somebody said, uh, emailed me and said, I didn't make money on some of your trades. It's like, well, I don't make money on some of my trades, okay? It's the few big trader few big trades that make a year so knowing that is one thing embracing it quite differently you're gonna be wrong quite a bit knowing that you're gonna be wrong and embracing that you're wrong and it happens silent sh implied are two different things now I've taken a hybrid approach where we're getting a swing trade out and that kind of gets the percent correct a little bit higher than if you were just a pure trend follower. If you're a pure trend follower, and it's kind of interesting, it comes back to like Pareto principle, comes back to what Robert Frey was saying. But if you're a pure trend follower, based on testing that I did probably 20 years ago, I discovered as a pure trend follower, you're only going to be right about 28% of the time, okay? So at least 72% of the time, you're going to be wrong. It's kind of close enough to be parade principle. So 20% of the time, you're going to be right and be right big. 80% of the time, you're going to be wrong, okay? But that 20% makes you year. Parade principle is 80-20. It means that 20% of your clients give you 80% of your money. 20% of your trades give you 80% of your money. 80% of 20% uh, of your family members give you 80% of your problems. You know, no matter where you go, you cannot escape Pareto principle. You won't be able to kiss all the women. Okay, my methodology is not a be-all end-all, and sometimes stocks just go up. Okay, so you can't say. You can't get bummed out if you miss a stock if there was no signal. Now, what I like to do every day, and this comes back to that deliberate practice that I often talk about, is when I do see a stock that made a big move, I stop when I'm going through my scans and take a look at it and say, was there a pattern of mine that should have caught it? Okay, now I've reached a level now where – Rarely there is one of my patterns there, okay, that would have caught it and I and I missed it. That's what I'm trying to say. But every now and then, by doing this over the years, it's like, well, maybe there's a new pattern I should be trading. So that's part of the deliberate practice, getting better and better at what you're doing. But if there wasn't a pattern of mine there, then I just get over it. OK, it's like, well, as I often say, you can't kiss all the women. But then a lot of people will have regret over a missed opportunity. They'll see a stock take off. It might be a choppy stock and all of a sudden just took off out of nowhere for no apparent reason. It was nothing could have predicted it, but they feel like they should have been able to catch that move or more specifically, my methodology should have been able to catch that move. So well, you, you have to embrace that no matter what you're trading. You're not going to catch every zig and every zag or every move. And this is something that I preach over and over again. At some point, you know, I need to put the word all in there. All trades will go against you. And again, that comes back to what I was saying earlier about your the amount of observations you make, the negative observations. But 
All trades are going to go against you. All trades will eventually end badly. You're either going to have a loss in a trade or you're going to give up some open profits in the end on a trade. It's maybe something somewhere in between. And the biggest, one of the biggest problems I see, again, it's, it's a micromanagement type of problem, is exiting at the first signs of adversity. And it comes back to that interjecting logic to the question, equation. Dave, the market was up big today. The stock went down. Something's wrong. I better get out. Well, what happens? The next day, market goes down, stock skyrockets. Okay. Uh, Dave, we've been in this position for a month. It's at a loss. I'm getting out. Well, what happens the next day? Stock gets bought out. Okay. Doesn't always happen like that. But if you quit, if you quit at the 50 yard line, you're never going to, you're never going to get anywhere. Okay. By the way, that's one thing I wanted to point out is playing not to lose is not a winning strategy. Playing not to lose is not a winning strategy. Write that down. Now, it doesn't mean you're, you're not using stops. That's just following your plan. You get stopped out. Drop an F-bomb. I certainly, I certainly will, and I certainly do. But then move on. Scream out next and move on to the next trade. But playing not to win, not to lose, I'm sorry, playing not to lose is having a stop in place and having a plan in place, and you get into a stock, and you're doing pretty good. Let's say you get in back here. You're feeling pretty good. You're feeling pretty happy. Okay. And then the stock starts rolling over a little bit. Say you got to stop here. Well, playing not to lose is, okay, I'm just going to get out here. Kind of like my Dell trade, right? And then what happens? You get out. You feel good. And then the market takes off without you. So playing not to lose, playing not to lose that extra little incremental amount is not a winning strategy, but I see it all the time. And guess what? Embrace the fact, know that every trade will go against you at some point in time. Now, there's plenty of fish in the sea. Sometimes you just have to cut bait. In other words, let that stop take you out. I got that cut bait from... Um, I, 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 I try to avoid getting sucked into any of these series because I just know myself. I think I have a bit of addictive personality. Uh, but somebody insisted that I watch Billions because they have a trading psychologist uh, on staff. And it was kind of interesting. The guy kind of went into the office all mopey, and she pumped him up. And she goes, now go fire up your Bloomberg, cut bait on those losers, and start finding some winners. You know, And sometimes you do have to cut bait. So – if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. I know I say this at nauseam, but people will say, Dave, uh, Dave, I'm down 50% in the stock. What do I do? It's like, okay, well, why are you in that stock? Because you recommended it. It's like, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. Yes, you did. <laughs> anyway, well, yeah, I did. That was last year. <laughs> it stopped out. Yeah, I remember that stinker now. It sucked. Okay, but, uh, you know, we moved on. Stopped out at 2% loss. And people will email me a year later. They're still holding on to the stock. And remember, we go in for a swing trade, and we stick around longer term. Things work out. Things don't work out. We get stopped out. We move on. But many a times, people will email me, and I see the same thing over and over. What do I do with this X, Y, Z? Well, what do you do? What you should have done was you should have followed your plan and not introduced a bunch of new decisions into the equation. And again, getting back to the flat time, sometimes you just have to wait. And But knowing that you might just have to wait and trying to make something happen during that wait time instead of just waiting, it's two different things. Again, the map is not a territory, okay? I have a client when I am very active in, in a lot and, and successful in a lot of picks, and usually you're not going to see many picks from me unless we're in a good conditions and, and things are kind of rolling along. But whatever things are rolling along the service, he does fantastic because I'm recommending a lot of stocks. He's taking a lot of stocks, and he's actually following the plan. He's doing really well. But what happens is when I stop recommending stocks because the market gets a little choppy, or if I can't find a setup to save my life, like recently, 
Uh, I don't know exactly what he's done recently, but I'll probably find out a few months from now. And what he does, instead of sitting on his hands, he starts taking mediocre trade, trade after trade after trade. I'll put out four stocks in my Landry list and say, here's four stocks. It's what I found. I'm not going to take any of them. I don't really like them that much, but I just want to show you I did my homework, and this is all I could find. Well, he'll buy those four stocks. Tomorrow I'll put out four more stocks. He'll buy those four stocks. And he'll – this vicious cycle repeats to where he might put on 20 positions when I put on zero. And it's kind of rinse and repeat. He gets he gets frustrated with everything. We have a little talk. I'm like, why did you take all those trades? Well, there's nothing to do. I felt like I had to do something. And then we hit a good cycle again. He's back to making money and doing really well. Rinse and repeat. And hopefully, I think we had a bit of a come to Jesus, so to speak, early this year. And I think we're okay. So I'll have to find another client to pick on, which shouldn't be hard. <laughs> because it is hard to follow along sometimes, okay? Easier said than done. The map is not the territory. But he has this problem of trying to force something to happen. Why? Well, he's a successful businessman. He makes a lot of money in his businesses. Okay, He's an entrepreneur. He also has uh, some other things that he's doing. And he's highly educated and he's smart. And smart people take action. Smart people are doers. Okay. Now, on the flip side of the of the way to get around, the drawdowns, flat times, whatever you want to call them, every now and then there will be a phase where you print money. I make the mistake of uh, years ago saying, calling my methodology streaky. Well, trend following in general is streaky, okay? And uh, find anyone who's a big trend follower and you'll notice that, wow, they just they – just, or the most amazing traders you ever met, and then they suck for a while, okay? That just comes to the territory. By the way, the only way to make money trading is to capture a trend. Even if you're a reverse to the mean trader, which I tend to pick on, you, you're going to have to – that new trend, that trend reversal is going to have – that's a trend, okay? You're going to have to buy higher than you sell, okay? I'm sorry, sell higher than you buy. I think that's how it works, right? in order to profit. So you will have to capture a trend. But every now and then, and boy, it's wonderful, but as I'm going to point out from Gelber in just one second, you you get hot. And, and if you've been in this business for a long time, when you get hot, it doesn't make you necessarily feel good. It actually is a little scary because you know it's going to eventually end. Okay, And if you don't have that feeling, it kind of goes to your head. And that's the dangerous part. And I've seen people do a lot of stupid things. They'll come into the service when I'm in that print money phase, and they'll print money, and then they'll think, I got this. Okay. Well, getting back to what I wrote in the aforementioned article, sometimes what you see is not all there is. I wish it was. Okay. But it's not. And I probably – I have a lot more clients if I didn't tell everyone that it doesn't always work, you know, uh, like some of these uh, jerks out there that are just making you say, oh, you could just it's it's real easy. You know, it's not easy. It's it's hard work. But sometimes you do print money. And this is the flip side of the big problems. I, the one problem I see is people get distraught and, and bummed out and depressed when they're not making money or losing some money. And then they quit right before the next big trend comes along. But just the flip side of that is it goes to their head when they're in the print money phase and they do something and they kind of feel this permanent income hypothesis. That's, that's, I think that's the only thing I remember from my MBA, <laughs> the only term I ever used. Uh, but they think it's always going to be like this, and unfortunately it isn't. And then they, they think they're going to – they don't have the FU money yet, <laughs> but – they feel like they're God and they feel like they have the ability to say F you, possibly quit jobs, quit businesses, because this trading thing is so much easier and a lot less hassle. And then this is what I alluded to earlier. This is from last week. Brian Gelber said that this is my view of the year of a life. The trader, four out of 12 months, you're hot. You're so excited that you can't sleep at night. 
you can't wait to get to work the next day, you're just rolling two months out of the year, you're cold, you're so cold, you're miserable, you can't sleep at night, <laughs> you can't figure out where the next trade is going to come from, and then the other six months out of the year, you make and lose, make and lose. Well, you can maybe move those numbers around a little bit, but he's pretty close, okay? And that's that's kind of like the life of a trend follower, at least. I think the life life of reversion to the mean trader is 11 months out of the year, you make money and you feel really good and you think you're God, and then one month or one week out of the year, you lose it all, <laughs> okay? Now, one thing I was thinking about, and I was putting together right before the show, is uh, I don't want to be the guy that just points out a bunch of problems and doesn't fix them. So how do we fix these things? And that's kind of what I was thinking about right before the show. And this is why I came up with seven steps towards fixing your problems. The, the first one and the most obvious one is to recognize anything that is, quite frankly, obvious or tangible going in. Okay, if you're undercapitalized to begin with, then you shouldn't be trading, okay? And you have to recognize that. You don't have enough money to trade. Now, what I rec recommend you do, and not to soft sell you, is maybe email me and say, hey, Dave, I don't have enough money to trade. Uh, can you make me a deal on a course or the service so at least I could follow along and learn? So what I would say is spend what little money you do have in education because I guarantee you if you go in undercapitalized, you're going to lose far more money than if you would just spend that money to get educated. So ask yourself, are you undercapitalized to begin with? And if you are, you need to reevaluate whether or not you want to trade. Okay. But if you're serious about trading, then by all means, make sure you study the markets and learn and again, apply your money towards education as opposed to losing it in the markets. Because you're putting yourself in a, a state of loss from the beginning. And it's going to be very hard to get out of that state. And, and as I talked about, if you do have a small account and you allow that, you trade that small account, you blow up that small account, you might feel pressure on yourself you might feel like you're a loser there's something wrong with you and the only problem is is that you just didn't have a big enough account to begin with uh do you have time for and then i just put question marks here whatever type of trading it's going to be my style of trading i often preach busy traders make good traders because there's usually not a whole lot to do. Occasionally there is. And when you're in that print money phase, it does take a little bit of time. But for the most part, there's not a whole lot to do. And 99% of my work is done after hours. So because I wait till after the market's closed and I do my scans, I might look at a few things during the day. But for the most part, my hard work begins as soon as the market closed. I'm, I'm, I make a big cup of coffee and I dive right in and start working. So, with my methodology, busy traders make good traders because they're not firing off a bunch of day trades or taking a bunch of unnecessary trades. They're focusing on their business and keeping themselves busy. But do you have time for, and I put those question marks in there, you can't be a day trader if you have a serious career and, and I've known of and, and this one guy's gonna think I'm picking on him but it's actually a combination of everyone <laughs> when I when I, I tell a lot of these stories but he he and there's, there's not just one guy but one guy I guess I should say <laughs> was carrying a laptop from patient room to patient room because he was day trading so he's either going to be a really crappy doctor or a really crappy day. He's going to be a crappy doctor and a crappy day trader. He can't do both at the same time. So just make sure you have time for it. And any other type of physical and obvious thing that could hinder your success. Does your spouse a significant under, under? <laughs> significant other support your 
foray into the markets, okay? Um, if they're if they can't handle the ups and downs and the risks, then they could put some pressure on you. And that's kind of like, well, maybe you're undercapitalized and so on and so forth. So recognize if there's anything that's obvious going in, I mean, it'd be a little easier to say, okay, well, if you're five foot tall, 50 years old, and slightly overweight, you you can't, you probably won't become an NBA all-star player, okay? So it's kind of like, in, in that type of business, it's a little bit more obvious, but there should be some things that are, that are, somewhat obvious going into the trading world such as being undercapitalized and not having time to, to day trade if you are a busy surgeon or whatever you are have you studied and studied and studied and studied and studied your methodologies this comes back to knowing your methodology do you know the nuances the good and the bad as i often say people approach from a system and i'll point out well you, you just lost it took you you lost 50 percent of your money over the la over one, it took a year, but you lost half your money. Yeah, but it came back. It did the year. Came, it all came back or whatever. It came back with the next year. It's like, well, could you really lose half your money? Do you know your system inside and out? So be a little bit of a devil's advocate when you're looking at something. Look for the good, but also look for the bad. We have a bad, I don't know what's this habit or trade as humans to where we kind of see the good, but sometimes we don't see the bad. Um, a lot of times there'll be people who have a system and they see every time the market took off, it would have made a hundred percent, but they don't notice the dozens of times in between where they would have lost 20, 30% or whatever. And all these bum trades in between. So that, that it's a losing strategy, but they just see that, see the good. So make sure you see the bad, be your own devil's advocate. Can you live with it? That's a thing, too. It, does it fit your psyche? Can you live with flat times? Can you live with printing money for a short period of time and then going back to grinding it out? Sort of like Mr. Galbert talked about. And then seriously, can you live with it? As I often tell people, follow through on just one trade. And I'm not a tough love kind of guy. But I'm beginning to rethink whether or not I need to be, okay? I, a few years back, I finally cut somebody off. They've been emailing me for years and years and years. And not following along in the service, not taking a course, not doing whatever, just asking me all these questions, and I tell them what to do. They go off and screw up. And they come back. It's like, well, I didn't do what you said, but what should I do? It's like, okay. And I reached the point where, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of nurturing you. You're on your own, okay? Because you don't, you don't hear me. You don't want to listen. Not that I have all the answers, but I have a lot of the answers, and I could solve a lot of the problems. I'm not smarter than anyone else. I'm just kind of prudent and realistic. I know that I could be wrong on a, any given trade, so I need to stop. I know that I might not be wrong longer term, so I take partial profits. Okay, I know that longer term trend following, you're going to be wrong most of the time. So I'm going to take a hybrid approach by taking those profits and transitioning into that longer term trade. And that is what I found to work. And I know these things. And you can too. But if you're not honoring your stops, if you're micromanaging, if you're doing all the things that I tell you not to do, then maybe you shouldn't be trading but if you I, I i believe anybody who wants to be a good trader or successful trader can be but you really have to want it and you're really going to have to resist those those innate human urges and, and do it but the way you do it is by doing it so just in the next trade and only that one trade follow the plan to a t and you really have to be process oriented. If you did what you were supposed to do, regardless of the outcome, pat yourself on the back. Maybe give yourself a minor reward, a little nice meal or something. Or I'm not a big golf player, but if you go play a round of golf, do something. Give yourself a little reward for following the plan, win, lose, or draw, regardless of the outcome. 
and then rinse and repeat for the next 10,000 trades. And if you do that, you will start hitting those big winners. You will eventually end in that print money phase. And by the way, um, I don't know if I have this in this list or not, but make sure you give yourself enough time to reap the rewards of the methodology. And again, I'm a big advocate. I'm very passionate about what I do, but it doesn't have to be my way or highway. But if you're following someone else's system or my system, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you stick around long enough to where you go through a print money phase, a lose money phase, and a grind it out phase and live through those cycles. So give yourself enough time. I don't know if I have that in this list, but I'm just thinking about that now. Make sure you give yourself enough time to where it all kind of smooths out. Because if you just get in and lose money, lose money, lose money, lose money for a few months, you're definitely going to quit. And you're probably going to go try somebody else's methodology. And as Murphy would have it, you're going to be out of phase, lose money, lose money, lose money, quit. And then that's going to just keep happening over and over. I see it happen over and over. People stick around long enough for the bad, but they quit right before things get good. Uh, embrace the unknown. That's really hard for people who, who have everything down to – uh, a science, okay, uh, surgeons, engineers, anything where things have to be fairly precise, it's pretty tough. It's like it's like a heart surgeon opens somebody up. It's like, oh, well, the heart's not where the heart used to be. It's in, in a chest. It's somewhere else. You know, no, it's, it's, it's everything is down to a fairly exact science. Well, trading isn't like that. You're dealing with the emotions – of a lot of other people and trading with technical analysis is simply reading the emotions of the, of the others. And then I'll throw in a little trading psychology while embracing your room. Now, provided you have number two down pat. Okay. Have you really seriously studied a methodology? It doesn't have to be mine. It could be anybody else's. Okay. Do you know it inside and out? And if you do, then you'll know, as the late great Mark Douglas said, that if you have losing trades, it means you're getting closer to winning trades. An example I, I, I talk about ad nauseum is he talked about a losing salesperson gets several lost, several uh, phone calls, several rejections in a row, and goes drinks his lunch. A winning salesperson gets several rejections in a world in a row. And then goes get a cup of coffee and gets back to the phones, knowing that he's getting closer and closer to those to make it a sale. Do nothing when there's nothing to do. Keep yourself occupied elsewhere. You know, there's a lot of physical things that can help you physically remove yourself from your screens if you feel tempted to do something and you shouldn't be doing something. And this is what I said earlier. Busy traders make good traders, at least with my methodology. They go off to save lives, build buildings, train dogs, and do other great things when there's nothing to do. So, and then also find that excitement elsewhere. The longer I've been at this, the more boring it is becoming. And I got into this business probably for the excitement, reading about these famous traders and stuff and how exciting that was going to be. And then I soon found out that it's hard work and you grind it out. And a lot of times there's not anything to do. So find your excitement elsewhere. Okay. Uh, any questions, anything? Quiet bunch today. Still working on a beginner's course and probably will be for life. <laughs> it's turned into this massive, massive thing. I don't know how many hours it's going to be. Uh, it, might be it might be comprehensive by the time I'm done with it. But uh, hopefully we'll have a multi-part uh, base coming out soon. So just uh, keep an eye on that. And that will be free. At least the multi-part base will be. Um, and then if you want to follow along, make sure at the least you're on a delayed service. Ideally, you want to be seeing things happen in real time. It's a little bit... It doesn't give you 
quite the full benefit if you're watching it delayed, obviously, even if, you, if you, even if you're not trading. Seeing it in real time makes it a lot easier. But at the least, just make sure you're watching the delayed, and you can find it on my website. Any questions, shoot me an email, and then check out my content on my website. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, ask. Uh, it, open it up for any questions, including individual stocks. And what I'll do, uh, if you don't mind, when you ask about a stock, just hit return after the symbol and then ask about your next stock. And that way I can know, uh, I'll know which ones we've covered and which ones we haven't. So let's take a look, quick look at the markets here and then let's work our way out to, um, to, your, to the sectors and then we'll get to your individual stock picks. First of all, let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500. And by the way, we did have a bow tie down here, but it hasn't triggered from all time high. So that's that's a little ominous, but I didn't get too excited because we did have this wide and loose trading below. So we did have support below the market. And as usual, follow through is key. So the fact that it didn't follow through to the downside made me feel a little bit better about the markets. And then, but if you back the chart out just a day or so, as I was saying recently to both uh, in the market in a minute and in the service, when a market drops below a range as this one has, if it pops right back up, then it becomes a bit of a do-over, becomes a bit of a knockout because everybody who bought during the range, they might have panicked when it sold off. And some might still be holding on and thinking about bailing. And if it turns right back around and goes straight back up, then it becomes a do-over and fakes everyone out. Now, my concern was my concern was that we spent quite a few days below this range. The longer we spend below this range, the stronger this resistance becomes. And that's just human nature. Okay. People might start thinking about getting on at break even. People might end up bailing. And then that selling can be getting more selling. But notice that we had a big day yesterday, so that's a good thing. And today, so far, we're seeing some follow through to the upside, and we're not too far from all time high. So, as a trend follower, one of my rules, and one of any trend follower's rules, is that you don't want to argue with the market when it's at or near all time highs. Yeah, I need to make things a little bit, I've been working really hard to make things more and more easier to find. But I think that if you go down to this getting started right here on my website, the question is, where is the delayed service? Um, it's under getting started. And the delay is going to be anywhere from a week, maybe slightly less to as much as two weeks. And the reason is we might have a stock that goes a week without triggering. OK, but it's still set up. Uh, here you go. Right here. Number nine. Uh, foresight and hindsight free edition. OK. Now, it's, it, there are some stipulations here, but it's usually a minimum one week and then uh, subject to, to duration and availability. If we get too many people on a delayed, uh, there's obviously a cost for that. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is we can't have everybody on delayed forever. But if you want to check it out, uh, so far I haven't had to, um, I haven't had too many people where I had to start uh, bumping people off. But and you could always sign back up if I bump you off, too. Anyway, so SP 500, uh, not too far from all time high, so let's not argue with that. Back to chart out a little bit. My big concern, not that it's line in sand, but if we drop below, let's just say 2100 ish, we'll be back into the soup that we had for what, 2015, 2016, up until recently, obviously. So that would be my biggest concern. Uh, you know, the routine one day at a time, as I often preach, uh, this is kind of a by the way, too. And this will actually test out. I'm getting, I see those questions coming in. No problem. I'll get to those in just one second. Let me just show you something real quick, and then we'll answer those questions. Keep them coming. Um, I don't actually trade this, but it's an observation, and it can be quite helpful. If you have a market, especially if it's in a longer-term uptrend, but if you get a market that's in a range and it sells off at out of the range, you could actually buy when it crosses back up through the range and that'll test out. Okay. It's kind of like a, a volatility type of situation, a volatility breakout because while it's in a range, what will happen is let's say you're coming from this trend back here, the volatility will begin to decrease. This is volatility. 
And volatility tends to be cyclical. In fact, some cases more cyclical than price. And when you have a low volatility situation, it tends to take off from that. But write this down. Your first move is often a false one. And if you go back in and watch the weekly charts from a few months back, you'll notice um, that right here we talked about that situation where you had a low volatility type of situation. That first move is a false one. Notice that it took off, went back to new highs. And then we kind of went back sideways. And then th this is another one of those situations where you have a knockout move. Doesn't always work. Obviously, nothing always works. And it's short-term timing, not necessarily longer-term timing. So it's not something that we definitely incorporate into what we're doing. But as far as our color commentary, as far as kind of having an idea of what's going on with the market, it is a very useful thing to know. So, so far, so good on that. You know me. I sure would like to see new highs sooner rather than later, maybe up around 2200 and more before getting too excited about the overall market. But you know the routine, take things one day at a time. Now what's been kind of interesting is during the sideways range and subsequent breakdown over the past several weeks in this range, up until this breakdown day here, we really haven't seen a whole lot of new setups. And that was the market telling us that something might not be right. NASDAQ, nice little breakout there, so far so good. What I was saying this morning in the market in a minute is sometimes, and I talked about it last night in the service, sometimes buying at new highs can beget more buying at new highs, okay? And the reason is that everybody at new highs who's already long is happy, so they're not in a big hurry to sell. And anybody who sold out before the new highs or failed to get in, is now faced with a dilemma. Do I sit on my hands and be left behind, or do I throw in a towel and buy? And that's why sometimes at a market making a new high, you'll get a big blow-off move because everybody will just pile in. Nobody wants to be left behind. So, so far, so good in the NASDAQ. This is looking really good. Now, let's take a look at the Rusty first, but the, the thing I want to point out is the sector action has been a little – been a little mixed and crazy. Rusty, another decent day there too, up another percent. Uh, it dropped like a stone in here. My big concern with the Rusty has been it just kind of crawled higher in here. When a market just kind of crawls higher, all it takes is one or two big down days to wipe out weeks, if not months, of gains. And that's what we saw recently in the Russell 2000. But so far, it snapped back nicely. And it's not too far from taking out this little peak in here. And the only other problem with the Russell, and there's always something to worry about, but if you do draw this line going way back in time, you'll see that we still have some overhead supply to overcome. But so far, so good. The good thing about the Russell is when it goes, it can go. Okay, It's a little less, a little more less efficient than the other disease. It can really take off. Okay. Martin has already left. Okay, didn't find us. I hope you found it before you left. Uh, in general, do you find weekly bow ties are more reliable than daily bow ties? That's a tough. That's a tough thing to answer. They're certainly much more significant. Okay, the last weekly bow tie in the S&P didn't work that well, but the prior four or five surely did of the last 30 years. Uh, it, it signified, or it signaled every major bull and bear market. So I guess the quick answer to that would be yes, but then they're going to be a lot less frequent. It doesn't happen every day. But if it's a weekly coming off of all-time highs or a weekly coming off of all-time lows, it usually pays to pay attention. So hopefully that answers that question. But as far as quantifying, it's something I haven't done. Uh, some areas are breaking out nicely to new highs. So the point is it's mixed, okay? Semiconductors break out the new highs. So far, so good there. But then you got some of these other areas in here like retail, which are looking dubious at best, okay? Let's see if we have a weekly bow tie there. No, not quite. But if if we if retail does a weekly bow tie down to answer your question, then yes, I would start selling this particular area. Anytime you see a sector, a stock, or an indice, an index, I should say, bow tie down off of all time highs or all time lows, it usually pays to pay attention on a weekly basis. Let's take a look at let's take a look at the gold stocks. See, notice the gold stocks, they bow tied off of like 10, 15 year lows. Okay, close enough. 10, 15 year lows. That's a pretty serious signal. Uh, all time highs here in gold are all time based on this index. Okay, bow tie down, that's a pretty serious signal. We're taking let's take a look at a weekly. Okay. 
So on a weekly basis, gold stocks bow tied down when 2011, and then what did they do afterwards? They dropped somewhat peaked the trough, 75 percent, 76 percent. Okay, round numbers. Now, what happened in more recent times with gold? The stocks notice they had bow tied here, and you can see they made a pretty big run higher. So on the gold weekly and metals and mining and some other commodities, you, you have a major weekly bow tie working, but on the daily chart, you have a daily bow tie down off of, off of several year highs, but not like 20 year highs or whatever the case was back here. So that recent slide is a little bit concerned, but sometimes these, these uh, especially the metals, can have nine lives, or the metals and commodities can have nine lives in here. And we had a really big day yesterday, up uh, like 7% gold. Uh, I think the metals and mining were up like 5% or so. Yeah, there you go, bam, right there. This was your, I've got it drawn in. This was your bow tie back here. This was your first thrust back here. So a signal off of major, major lows is usually a pretty big deal. Let's take a look at the weekly there. Is that a weekly? Yeah, that's a weekly. So you did have a bow tie here. It hasn't really taken off tremendously from that, but you do have a major signal working. And then look, I got it drawn in. There was a weekly sell signal there in the metals and mining. How many times I have to tell you? Every, every Wednesday I do a show. Margin call. I hope it's not a margin call. <laughs> that's what <laughs> that's what I say when I'm speaking. I think, uh, who was it? Uh, somebody told me to say that. Bryce uh, used to work at Trading Market. Says, hey, I got something funny for you. Say, whatever. Somebody's cell phone goes off while you're giving a speech. Uh, say, hey, you get a margin call? Don't answer it. Um, technology in general coming back nicely in here. Software looked a little dubious, but it kind of looked like the S&Ps. But you can see it's coming back nicely in here. Uh, sub areas like Drugs looking not so great. Anything interest rate sensitive up until this little rally we had yesterday didn't look so hot, such as REITs and utilities. So the point I'm trying to make without going through too many of these is that it's getting kind of mixed in the sector. It has been kind of mixed in the sectors. But if the indices go on, if all the indices go on to make new highs, then obviously that rising tide is going to lift all boats and we won't have to worry too much. One thing that I would encourage you to do is uh, I call them the major MIGs, those uh, morning industry groups or whatever they call them now, morning star groups now. But I like to go through these major MIGs. I go through all 239 of them every day. But then sometimes just for illustrative purposes, I like to go through these major MIGs. You can, it gives you a good feel kind of what's going on overall. And you can see some areas have kind of rolled over in here, bow tied down, material construction, manufacturing, uh, some areas sideways, leisure. So the point I make it here is that if you go through these every day, at least go through these. If you don't want to go through all in 239, you'll see that it's pretty mixed throughout the sectors. But again, if the indices start making new highs, then that's going to trump um, what's going on. Uh, XME for Andre. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, let me just cover a couple. Let's cover a couple things in here. Then we'll uh, we'll get to the individual issues. Let's take a look at bonds. Bonds had a little spill recently. Now they're working their way back up. Uh, so that was a little concerned. This is another one of those fake out, shake out type of deals, baby. If we get back above, let's say 140 in the TLT, then looks like bonds are going to go a little bit higher for a while. I guess we'll have 0 0.000001 interest rates. Uh, but it is interesting that bonds are bouncing back in here. They, I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet, but it certainly looks like they're coming back. If anything, it looks like they're still in trouble, but so far, they're coming back in. If they come right back up and take out the range, then all bets are off as far as trying to short these guys. Um, in general, I wouldn't rush out and short them anyway. It's an efficient market. But the reason I'm showing you bonds is because at some point, we're going to have to pay attention to what's happening in bonds because bonds go down, rates go up, and that could have an effect on stocks. That's a little intermarket technical analysis. Now, the next question is, Dave, do you use intermarket technical analysis? And my answer to that is yes and no. And yes, because it matters, but no, not all the time, because it doesn't matter all the time. So sometimes with the intermarket technical analysis, you have long lead and lag cycles. So rates might be going up for a long time, and eventually it affects stocks. Okay, Or rates might go up a little bit, and all of a sudden stocks overreact. So it only matters when it matters. So be really careful if you're trying to do that. All right, uh, let's take a look. Let's take a look at gold commodity real quick, and then we'll do these individual uh, things. Gold commodity is a little bit different than gold stocks lately. It's going kind of sideways, waking up a little bit in here. I wouldn't rush out and buy gold just yet. 
But hey, you know what? Just for S and Gs, let's see. Yeah, we got a weekly bow tie working. Uh, to answer your question on weekly, do pay attention to weekly bow ties. Uh, so far, so good as far as that major new bull market in the works there. But as you know, it's looked a little sideways and almost iffy as of late. All right, uh, Andre wants to know XME another wave up in the works. Could be. Um, now on a daily chart as we have here, you could see it just really hasn't looked that hot and doesn't look like something that you want to rush out and trade. But let's take a look at a weekly. On a weekly chart, just to give you a little perspective, so far it just looks like it's rallying out of a pullback or trying to come out of a pullback. And so far, again, it just looks like a pullback. So I wouldn't get too excited uh, one way or the other here, but as far as the major trend, I think the major trend is still up in the metals, okay, until proven otherwise. And then if you're looking at XME, you would have a little resistance up here, but that's still a ways away. So if it made it, if it made it from here to here, that's still a pretty good run. Float worth to incorporate in decision making from the perspective of demand and supply. Uh, no, I don't worry about. I don't worry about float too much or at all. I just I worry about price. Uh, by float, you're talking about the amount that's controlled by the public, or uh, I don't I don't really worry about those things. I, th I think you could start worrying about that. If you worry about that, then you have to worry about some other things. And before you know it, you're going to be pulling into fundamentals, and then you could end up with analysis paralysis. As long as you have good, decent trading volume, that's the only thing I would worry about. Okay, just uh, enough volume to make it worthwhile, liquid enough to trade. If you like the setup, then take the setup. Don't justify why you should not take it by using something like float. Now, if that becomes part of your system, like I said earlier, it's not my way or highway. If you think that should be part of your system, don't let me mess you up. Make that part of your system, but then always consistently apply that to your system. ELC for Mr. Don. All right, Don, let's take a look. Uh, looks kind of thin. Um, this is an IPO, and I've been talking a lot about IPOs in the last couple of years. And look at this. It's just going straight up in here. Wow. It's making new highs. Well, we should buy it. Don't you have a buy at new highs strategy with IPOs? I, I do. Well, wait a minute. Look at the scaling on this. An IPO, you have to ask yourself, what's the story of fat of glory? There's... Why bring a company public unless there's some excitement, okay? There's got to be something exciting about the company to bring it public. So if a company comes public and trades within a 50-cent range for months, then there's not a whole lot of excitement there. So in a case like this, you want to wait for what I would call a secondary signal. See if it can rally significantly and then look to maybe play a pullback along the way. So I would pass on this one. Always check your scaling, 2450, 25. That's two, that's just no range there, okay? It's not worth trading. A-R-E-X for Mr. John. Hey, John, good to see you. Well, the pullback here has been a little too, maybe a little too deep. In this particular case, and let's count the days, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 days, okay? Usually within within a pullback setup, I like to see it go maybe no more than nine days or eight or nine days or so. Also, it's also pulled back into this prior base. By the way, keep in mind that there's not a whole lot of stocks that are set up just yet uh, based on the cycle. So... Like somebody said recently, he's like, oh, you always hate all my picks. No, it's not necessarily that I hate all your picks. You just started coming to the show while the market was trading sideways, and I couldn't find a setup to save my life. So I'm surely not going to say your setups look better because there's just no setups. It's not you. It's not me or the guy who screams on TV. <laughs> it's just there's no setups. Also, of notice is this pull back in below this prior little breakout point here. So I would pass on this one. I mean, I hear you. It's taken off. It's got a deep retracement, but it's pulled back past its prior breakout point. So I'd pass on that one. A-R-I-A -A for John. That one's a little too crazy now. Um, maybe not. I've got to confuse another one. Oh, I don't like this big gap down in this one. 
I hear you though, and it's coming into this overhead supply. I know that's a long time ago, but sometimes markets have bad memories, long memories, I should say. So I think I'd pass on that one, even if it pulled back. Would home meet your criteria? Let's take a look at that. Again, not a whole lot probably will. Uh, no, well, home's coming into this overhead supply, okay? So for me to get excited about home, it would have to break out to new highs and stay there, okay? Which it has not, okay? And it's kind of interesting when you have a big wide range bar in the first day or the, or the high is set on the first day, the breakout strategy then becomes a close above that high, which it did not do on this day. So kind of dodged a bullet on that one. But now it's coming into a little resistance. So for me to get excited about this, we'd have to do one or two things. Go on to make new highs and then pull back or come down and wait down here and base for a long, long time and then maybe start bow tying up or whatever. Air G, Air G is one that's really been taken off as of late. Yeah, it looks uh, it looks kind of interesting. On a pullback, absolutely. Put that on your momentum watch list. It's on my list for something to watch. But yeah, next pullback, absolutely. High five to a recommended it. Not set up though. Karen wants to know about. Oop, I deleted it. KLH. What was it? What was the? Oh shoot. Karen, I deleted your symbol. I'm sorry. NAC. N A K. S T Z. Okay. Uh, next up. Uh, no, because you've you've you pull back in here too many days okay uh so i would pass on that stz for miss karen constellation uh no karen no you know is if you're trend following then no if you've got some other system then maybe uh but i don't i can't imagine what system that would be no it's sideways uh, and then that, that, we go all the way back to when, um, it's up 1% over the last four and a half, five months. Uh, no, you know, better than that. You're waiting for the breakout. Well, I'm not a breakout player. Beep, beep, beep. Yeah. Donald's got it right. Let's cardigram, but not too bad. I hear you. I mean, I hear you. It's a longer term uptrend. Okay. If you're long, stay long, but I wouldn't take it as a trade in and of itself. Also take a look at the HV. 14, what's the S&P right now? What's the Russell? 13, um, s and is even less, huh? Yeah, s and is 9, Russell's what, 13? Yeah, 13 in the Russell. So you want to trade as a general state, but something that's more volatile than the overall market. BVN, that's going to be a gold stock. Andres loves those gold stocks. No, it's just kind of sideways, wide loose lately. These golds are going to have to break out again. For them to set up. And again, not a be all end all methodology, but the goals have to set up again. Uh, SLV for Greg. Same sort of action in silver. It's going to have to break out to new highs and then pull back before it's worth trading again. Let's do take, let's take a look at the longer term chart there real quick. I know we're running late today, but uh, we'll, let's see if we get a few more in. Yeah, longer term silver looks okay. Uh, over there, swing trade to intermediate term trade, trading time frame. It'll have to break out to new highs uh, before. Uh, before it gets me excited again, look to get in. Uh, Mr. Donald wants to know about NPTN. NPTN. Yeah, it looks, uh, looks pretty good. Um, it did, yeah, it got past a prior peak in here. It looks okay. I like a little bit more knockout, but it's not bad. This actually has been on my list lately. Uh, so I'll give it a not bad. A tiny bit more knockout would be nice in that one, but it's certainly, you could certainly do a lot worse. So I, I do like that one. Five and, uh, the only problem with this one is it kind of pulled back below this prior little peak in here. It looks okay longer term, but I think I'd pass based on this, the fact that it pulled back to this prior base. I, I hear you though. It's, it's, it's not bad. It's not horrible. Okay. OCLR, OCLR. Yeah, this looks good uh, on a knockout move, though. You, you're going to need another knockout move to get in. So uh, we're probably going to have a lot of civvies that look a lot like that. We'll go after soon. Uh, CRBP, CRBP, CRBP. Uh, yeah, it looks good. Uh, decent volume. Uh, it should definitely be on your watch list. My main concern here is that it did go straight up. It went up about 100% over a short period of time. So make sure you wait for a very deep knockout type of pullback, okay, or a pullback, however you want to look at that, uh, because it's gone so far so fast. You want to make sure that the Johnny come lately is getting knocked out before you look to go after it. Hey, Gloria, PLSC, good to see you. P 
PLSE, PLSE. I'm not familiar with that one. Relatively new issue, super, super thin. Uh, yeah, really thin. Be careful on that one. Maybe if it were to knock out soon or continue higher and then knock out, but again, super duper thin, so be careful on that one. SBIO, SBIO, and we just have time for just a few more, so get them in quickly. I won't, I won't be able to get into all of them. Yeah, this one's a little too thin because it's been out for a while. Uh, is this an ETF? Well, it's an ETF, so sometimes you can trade a thinner ETF. Um, if you're a big trader, you can actually call them. They can make a market for you uh, if you want to trade a million or two million or a billion dollars. But it's it looks like it's going to push into this overhead supply, so I think I'd leave it alone on that. TCMD. TCMD. Uh, I know I was long winded today, so that's why I'm doing a few more. But we'll have to shut it down here in just one second. Yeah, this looks pretty good. It needs a little bit more knockout, but it's certainly a good looking stock. So whoever gave you that one, uh, volume looks a little thin. It is an IPO, so we might have to do a little bit more analysis on here. Yeah, a little bit on the thin side, even though it's uh, – if this was an existing stock, I would say pass based on the volume, but it looks like it does have a few decent volume days. Maybe on a little bit more knockout move. Greg wants to know about AMBA, probably be the last one today. Um, well, it already triggered on your pullback. So if you're long, stay long. But lately it's been traded mostly sideways. So if you're long, stay long. But it's not set up as a new setup in and of itself because let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. About 20 days since new high. So it's lost a little bit of steam in here. So wait for new highs and then play new pullbacks along the way. In the semiconductors, we should start seeing a lot of setups soon, okay? Well, look, I'm going to have to wrap it up. I know we went long today. Uh, thank everybody for putting up with me. I appreciate that. Uh, any unanswered questions, daviddavelander.com. If we don't talk again between now and the weekend, everyone have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see all you guys and girls uh, at the next show. Thank you so much. Next Thursday, check my website for uh, updates on that. Thank you so much.